Summary. You can't outclimb the vortex. All thermals are 200 meters across. The thermal outward gust. Thermal sensations. The toroidal vortex bubble interactions. Zero to three hundred in ten days, fifty to three hundred in four days. Do it by the book. Entrainment. Entrainment is simply the mixing of air, of humid air to dry air and warm air to cool air. At normal heights of thermal vortex generation, it is important to recognise that the entrainment of air from beneath the bubble is less than expected due to buoyancy, unlike the water experiment. The cooler air below resists being drawn upwards by what is otherwise warm air or humid air. Once the thermal has been triggered, it usually maintains its rate of ascent. It requires a significant external influence to either accelerate it or become destroyed. The thermal structure vortex. First to the bubble vortex ring. Imagine a solid ball or balloon going through the air. An eddy will be set up which must generate a vortex motion. However, the faster the thermal rises, the stronger the vortex, therefore the stronger the sink around the bubble. Bear in mind that the hot air is not going down. A major difference between strong and weak thermals. Consider the difference between trying to climb a light glider versus a heavy glider or a poor performing glider. So in this thermal we're saying that the black values are the actual air mass climb rates, the movement of the air. And here's my glider in its turn. The glider rate of descent, if we say it's one knot when it's straight and level, then whilst we fly straight at this point, with the air mass underneath us moving at two and a half knots, then the varia will indicate a rate of climb of one and a half knots. As we enter our 45 degree angular bank turn, our rate of descent increases by 40%. So the glider falls at 1.4 knots, the air is moving up at 2.5 knots, so the vario will give us a rate of climb of 1.1 knots. If our rate of descent is 2 knots because we're very heavy or a poor performing glider, then we'll get an indication of a rate of climb of half a knot when we're straight and level. But when we enter our turn to try and call the thermal, we actually only achieve a 0.3 knot rate of descent. Single gyro rigidity. The gyro has got rigidity. And here we have a thermal, and effectively it's a two-dimensional continuous loop gyro. So there is some rigidity in this formation of air movement. Buoyancy is the upward driving force resisted by aerodynamic drag. And that aerodynamic drag we can call zero lift drag. So profile, interference, drag. There's a circular flow within which the flow is relatively laminar, otherwise there would be drag within the vortex itself. 
the black arrows indicate a horizontal outward gust that we experience and can detect on the airspeed indicator. Wind shear can collapse this continuous loop gyro. If the thermal becomes elongated at all, then again the whole structure of it becomes unstable and it will break apart. Back to the ladies favorite electrical toy, our hair dryer. For a better picture of understanding the air flows around a thermal then, we know there will be a strong updraft coming out of this hair dryer like this, resisted by the air in front of it. Meanwhile, at the bottom of it, it's drawn from a very large area and so there's gentle inflow at the bottom. So rather than depicting it in this way, it might be better to depict it a little more like this. We can often see vortices, what we call thermal and their structures. Here you can see it in a power station. Of course, when we consider thermal sources, we often talk about heat, whereas in fact we want to include humidity in that. So notice that despite the strong, th strong thermal source, the thermal accelerates, then slows and starts to drift, once clear of the towers, and a vortex is established. Castellations will then also start to establish themselves with the sink of the evaporated cloud and bubble thermals will develop. Of course the chimneys to the right, the thermal out of the hot thin chimney expand, but it's very heavy air with a weak or no vortex whilst the cooling tower thermals actually contract initially and form stronger vortices. Lift in different parts of the thermal. So blue K vortex foot. The blue and grey shows the vortex rotation. The difference between the ascent of the bubble and the surrounding sink is around two knots. Lift in different parts of the bubble then. The blue shows the vortex rotation and the green is the bubble ascent. Of course here we are, cored in our thermal, climbing quite happily. We may even rise towards the top of that little vortex. If however we don't use 45 degrees of bank and turn a little bit wider. We're going to maintain our position in the vortex. If we have a bigger circle or are too far below the vortex, then actually we get dumped. And we can see all of these effects whenever we fly with other gliders and fly differing turn radii or have different performance. Of course there is an idea that if we reduce the bank that we can climb higher into the bubble and that is not correct. Fundamental flows of lift and sink. Lift, the top of the vortex is rather like a mushroom sink whenever we encounter it is really falling down, accelerating down like a waterfall.
the sucking of the vortex or cloud suck. Here we have our thermal passing upwards and there will be a suck behind it caused by the evaporating cloud generating an increase in sink around the edges and therefore we do get some entrainment from underneath the cloud. Consider the vortex rising as a donut ring then, or a smoke ring, and the inside and outside drag surface areas. On the inside of the ring there's considerably less surface area than the outside of the ring. Buoyancy maintains the upward force, but the greater outside surface area generates more drag on the movement of the air and generates rotational outwards flow from the top. The vortex misconception. If we trap a particle within the vortex, we might imagine we would get this kind of a flow. That the particle goes up and then down a bit, up three, down two, and so on. In reality, this is what we get. It goes up, and it stops in line with the flow of air outside of the vortex and then it goes up again and then stops up again and then stops. Temperature distribution within the vortex. Obviously if we thought the centre core of the thermals was significantly hotter than the rest of it we'd actually feel it in strong thermals and we don't. The temperature of all the air rotating within the vortex at the same height is the same except for entrainment, losses through conduction on the edge. Sink flows around an individual bubble. What is the temperature buoyancy distribution across a thermal core on a blue day? So, the sink areas are going to be minus a bit of the environment and the bubble itself is going to be plus a bit. Variation of buoyancy, temperature across a thermal at level height on a blue day. There is very little temperature change if any, as we transit across the rising area of a thermal. A cumulus day. Variation temperature in a humal thermal, a level height on a cumulus day, is just the same. There may, though, be a negative temperature change as we transit across the rising area of a thermal which is purely humid. The buoyancy of the thermal is because of the humidity, not because of the temperature. Relative strength of the vortex then. Airflow reaction is going to be at the top and everything else is a res as a result of that initial movement. It is important to remember that the edge only goes down relative to the vortex and is zero relative to the real world, or it will create drag and slow stop the vortex. So we have a laminar flow here. Drawing thermals to scale then, if we consider these thermals here are 200 meters across, in our diagrams we may well present our glider in this way. Of course the glider has not got a 150 meter wingspan. The reality is rather more like this. So our glider then with a 20 meter wingspan 
standard 20 meter two seater. The radius is about five times our wingspan. When we look at lift distribution, we find that the lift distribution of strong or moderate thermals is just the same over 200 meters. So here we have our thermal of 1, 3, 5 and 7. So we can see that really we need to turn as tightly as we can with minimum height loss to achieve our best rate of climb. And it also shows why a buzzard won't out climbers in a weak thermal but only in stronger thermals. The lift distribution is over the same width. So here we are turning at 45 degrees angle of bank. If the air is moving up at 3.4 knots our rate of descent is 1.4 so we get a net climb of two knots. If the thermal is 8 turning at 45 degrees angular bank here we go with six knots. Golf putting analogy. We have to hit harder to get up the steeper slope. to counter the downhill side of the slope. In our thermal it's a bit the same way. We have to fight the outflow. Rising and falling airflows. What does zero on the vario mean in a 45 degree angular bank turn? Well it means that the thermal air at that point is moving at 1.4 knots or thereabouts. Of course, the second question is, in what part of a thermal do you feel the maximum acceleration? Well, it's not when the vario hits a peak. Rising and falling actual airflows. Essentially, there's a two knot difference between the rising and falling airflows. So here comes my glider. It experiences the sink, and so we'll see three down on the Vario. As we move into the core, because the air is moving up at four and the glider's falling at one, then we see three up on the Vario. And that's fantastic for us because it means whenever we hit the sink, we know exactly how strong the thermal core is. Strong and weak thermal set. Here we have one knot going down so our vario will read two down. When we go into the centre core the vario will read two up. Hitting a stronger thermal we'll have five down and we'll get five up in the middle. The airflow is strongest at the top of the core and that's when we get our gust on the airspeed indicator. Again it's important to remember the edge only goes down relative to the vortex and is not necessarily down relative to the real world. simple flow of the toroidal vortex again with the weak flow and the strong flow. The weaker the thermal, the weaker the outflow. The stronger the thermal, the stronger the outflow. So why must we turn stronger in tighter and stronger thermals? 
Well, very clearly here we can see there's a very little drift from the center core in the weak thermal, but a very powerful force pushing us out in a strong thermal. So we have to fight more aggressively to stay in a strong thermal. This outwards flow is effectively outwards drift during the term. Two knots gives us about two degrees of drift, which will increase our turn radius by three meters. A six knot thermal, however, is six degrees of drift, and that increases our turn radius by 10 meters. That's a good reason to turn tighter in strong thermals. And in very strong thermals, the theoretical maximum efficient angular bank is increased above 45 degrees angular bank. The thunderstorm or the supercell. Triggered by sink. So here my cells are going up. A lot of cells are going up making a cloud. The cloud generates a wide ring of sink which is very powerful which triggers a greater inflow and upflow to the center core of the cells and we end up with the generation of a supercell, a super column thermal. The outward gust. Ring one is sink associated around the bubble. B is sinking air within the vortex and three in green rising air within the vortex. To the bottom right we can see we're going to get an airspeed indicator gust which is telling us that the centre core is in front of us. If we're the blue glider and we haven't hit the middle of the thermal, we'll find that the string is deflected before we get a beam the center core of the thermal. If we're the red glider, we'll find we'll get an airspeed reduction gust, telling us that the thermal is behind us. The vortex v the hillside. You will have seen from the wind tunnel app that any interference of the motion of fluids and the air with any obstruction will destroy the vortex and so we get no vortex next to ridges and mountains only above them. The polar curve then for this is purely hypothetical uh, diagram for clarity then. So to the left we have the glider's rate of descent and if it were climbing a rate of climb. The top we have the speed. And if we plot speed with rate of descent we get a graph like this. This indicates our minimum sink speed. Our best glide, however, is a relation of speed forwards and sink. And here we have, or as always, a higher speed than minimum sink to achieve best glide. Rate of descent increases as angular bank increases. To deduce what is the best speed to thermal at, we can produce a polar curve based on angular bank and the speed to fly which achieves minimum height loss after completing 360 degrees. And we can see here that if we fly at 40 degrees angular bank we'll lose 160 feet completing 360 degrees. At 45 degrees we'll lose 130 feet. At 50 degrees we'll lose 160 feet. So in actual fact, our best glide is achieved at 45 degrees angle bank because we've lost the least amount of height for completing 360 degrees. 
on the left you can see how speed doesn't help us. Flying faster increases our rate of our radius of turn significantly. Why thermal at 45 degrees a bank then? It optimizes the balance between lift to keep the glider flying and the lift used to make the glider turn with minimum drag penalties, i.e. loss of performance. Why use top rudder whilst thermally, i.e. string towards the top wing? Well, we need to consider glider design. As we go out towards the wingtips, there's wing taper, dihedral and polyhedral, and wing sweep. Wing taper. Wing taper is re used to reduce the induced drag losses. Winglets reduce the losses further, allowing a slower minimum flying speed. Instead is the cross wing airflows during side slip generated by thermal gusts. Dihedral and polyhedral generates lateral stability by increasing the cord on tapered wings and angle of attack on the leading wing during a side slip. The trailing edge is lower than the leading edge, increasing the angle of attack of the inside wing. Here the trailing edge is higher than the leading edge, decreasing the angle of attack. In other words, less lift on the trailing wing. So here we have a DG1000. And we can see it's got a combination of polyhedral, sweep and winglet. Why use top rudder whilst thermaling? Well, here's the wing sweep exaggerated. The airflow hits the wing more squarely, producing more lift than the trailing wing where the airflow hits obliquely. Combining wing taper, polyhedral and wing sweep means that during a slipping turn, the inside wing is generating more lift efficiently where the stronger updraft is than the outside wing. Rate of descent increases as angle of bank increases. We know that. But if we draw the polars, here we have 20 degrees angle of bank, starting at the stall to minimum sink and best glide. Here's 35 degrees angle of bank, and here's 45 degrees angle of bank. It's important to note that as angle of bank increases from 45 degrees, the best speed to fly is not proportional minimum sink speed, but basic stall speed. The polar curve moves such that the stall just above it is minimum rate of descent speed. When turning two knots above minimum sink speed, no top aileron will be required. Flying closer stall in a 45 degree angle of bank turn. Because we are operating at the edge, the sudden loss of some speed caused by entering the outwards gust causes the loss of elevator authority. The rate of turn will be lost and the nose will fall. The vario will give a sudden loss of climb performance. 
the glider is not stalled when that occurs. Here we can see the effect of speed and angular bank. As turn radius reduces and rate of turn increases by flying slower or increasing our angular bank. Notice then in strong thermals we could have 55 knots and 50 degrees angular bank just as easily as we could have 45 knots and 40 degrees angular bank. But the important thing here is that we're able to fight against the outwards gust more aggressively than we can at slower speed. Here we can see almost 68 knots in our turn. Rate of climb 11 knots. If we look then 65 knots and 45 degrees angular bank our radius of turn has increased hugely to 114 meters. Stall speed with angular bank. Here we have our angular bank of down the left of 30 degrees, 35 degrees and 45 degrees. If our basic stall speed straighten level is 34 knots, then at 30 degrees of bank it's 36 knots, at 35 it becomes 39, and at 45 degrees angular bank it becomes 43. Perhaps more realistically then we have a 40 knot basic stall speed, so at 30 degrees of bank it becomes 42, at 35, 45 knots, and at 45 degrees angle bank, 50 knots. What five things do we use to find a thermal? Well, our eyes has got to be the first thing, looking at the sky, the clouds, and the ground, and other gliders and birds. Feel is probably the most important attribute you can have to feel the air move the glider around and therefore deduce that the glider is going up or being kicked sideways. The airspeed indicator on its gusts because horizontal gusts only come from vertical movement of the air. The string and finally our brain interpreting all of the above. Please note that the vario is used to confirm that we have found a thermal. It's not used in reality for finding a thermal and coring on it. Thermal sensation and the structure then. Before arriving at the climbing part of the thermal you must go through the sink which effectively tells you how strong the thermal will be. You'll then pass through a horizontal gust indicated on the airspeed indicator with effectively no lag and assuming your airspeed indicator is good it'll be accurate. A string deflection will indicate if this is from one side or the other. In other words you haven't hit the thermal head on. This gust is also indicated on the vario through the total energy compensation. I quite like electronic instruments rather than static ones because when they go wrong they invariably just need new batteries. The cobblestones turbulence is produced when there is a temperature difference between the up and down flows. Therefore it occurs on the edges and within thermals hot only and on the boundary of cold descending air and the edge of a thermid or humal column thermal updraft. A rather large thermal, the atomic weapon. But even that will show the classic symptoms of a toroidal vortex. Feel then tracking through the bubble centre at different heights. 
we get toroidal sensations. All turbulence is caused by rising and falling air. So at the top then it's potentially good. We'll get some turbulence, perhaps a little lift, mainly dynamic, and some sink. It's potentially good. Down the bottom here you may get some turbulence and sink. Perhaps a little lift, but it's chaotic and you will fail to climb. Feel tracking through the bubble center at different heights then. We are also feeling for the horizontal gusts. The Vario responds to total energy airspeed indicator gusts. Beware. So along here we get a bit of turbulence, perhaps a little lift or a sudden upward surge, but often dynamic lift and weak sink. This distribution cruising through weak and strong thermals. We had a look a little earlier at the structure of strong and weak thermals. Now here's my little one knot thermal and here's my stronger thermal of five knots. A major difference between strong and weak thermals. Consider the difference between turning to climb or passing through on the benefit band. So here I am cruising through quite a strong thermal. The glider rate of descent straight and level is one knot again. At 45 degrees it's 1.4 knots. A perfect turn gains 85 feet which gives a net climb of 2.6 knots. A bounce gains 36 feet, so actually a 55% loss on what we would have gained if we'd stopped to climb in it. But we still get a net climb. If we look at a much weaker thermal now, one knot rate of descent straight and level, 1.4 knot rate of descent at 45 degrees of bank. A perfect turn gains 16 feet. Net climb is half a knot. A bounce gains 12 feet. So although we've had a 25% loss, the gain we make is really quite small. So we're much better off linking any weak thermals together and keep bouncing along until we get to a strong climb. Of course, we might have about the weakest thermal that we can possibly have. Here, the glider rate of descent just the same at one knot, 1.4 in our 30, 45 degree angular bank turn. A perfect turn loses height. We become minus 0.2 of a knot, whereas a bounce straight through will give a gain of 8 feet. So you must disregard the weakest thermals. There's a stable vertical bubble distribution. These vortices tend to be sympathetic towards each other in their movement because the air flows are going in the same direction even when they cross next to each other. So in here we can see the sink flows from the top thermal going around and they will marry quite nicely with flows that are following up close behind. Moving upwind to the next bubble, in this particular case then, we will pass through the sink and straight into the next core. If these cores are close to each other, we can see that the air flows of the two edges of the vortices are going in the same direction. They're actually supporting each other without any trouble whatsoever. So even if they meet, the separate flows of the two vortices are sympathetic. They're not counterproductive. So what we get on our indicator then is as though there's one elongated thermal, but there isn't. Why are clouds this shape and not this shape? 
Well, because of adjacent cells reinforce each other. Stepped vortex harmony then. We look at the vortices here, we have the individual values. If we marry these two together, then we end up with this kind of a pattern on our vario. And if we fly straight down the middle, then we may get the impression that there's an elongated and rather cluttered thermal, but it's just two vortices next to each other. The elongated thermal then doesn't exist. All thermals are round. So here we go, quite happily, we hit the six knots and that's great. But if we try and turn where the six knots is, invariably we're too late. We end up unable to turn within that core because the outflow is so powerful and we end up with very heavy sink on one side or the other. Which is why whichever way you turn you fall out of it. And this is a common uh, comment that people will enter a very strong thermal and then find they have great difficulty in centering in it. And that's because if you go through the middle there isn't a glider manufactured that turns tightly enough to stay within the half, half a turn of what you turn currently. So what you have to do is anticipate it. You have to offset before you get to the strongest core. And by reading the sky and watching its development, you'll get an idea as to whether the cloud ahead is stronger and whether you want to turn in it. One indicator is, of course, the airspeed gust, which you will get. So if it's a very powerful gust and it is head-on, then you need to turn and then reverse if you have a glider which is agile enough to do that. Speed versus angular bank, then. Here's a table of speed with angular bank and the turn radius achieved in meters. The outflow flow of the vortex increases the turn radius in six knot thermals by 10 meters. So you can see the perfect solution might be 45 knots and 45 degrees angle bank or 50 knots and 50 degrees angle bank. Of course, if you could fly slower, like a T21 at a slower speed of 35 knots or something and 45 degrees angle bank, that would be just magnificent. However, modern machines aren't designed for that. If we thermal at 55 knots and choosing turn using 45 degrees angular bank, the out rate of turn means that we take 18.4 seconds to complete 360 degrees. Six knots, i.e. 10 feet per second of outflow, gives us 184 feet of drift. Our turn radius thus increases by 64 feet, i.e. 19 metres. At 50 degrees angular bank, 15.4 seconds, at 50 knots and 14 seconds. We thermal at 55 knots and turn using 35 degrees angular bank. Our rate of turn means that we take 26.2 seconds to complete 360 degrees. Again, 6 knots, 10 feet per second of outflow, gives us 260 feet of drift. Our turn radius thus increases by 95 feet, or 29 metres, to a staggering 145 metres. Strong thermals, turn tight. Simple vortex flow, a climbing troidal vortex then. Here we go. And it generates a cloud at the top, and we often see these donut shaped clouds as they form. Thermal equilibrium, then, this marrying up of the downflow of the vortex to the outside air is really important, and it will maintain its speed. Here we have the lion on the bike. The cyclist will achieve a specific speed when the drag balances the thrusting force of gravity. If we give a push or drag back to slow him down and let go, the cyclist will return to the equilibrium speed. And that's what will happen to a thermal. Bubble distortion, 
the squeezing of the vortex by sink. If we end up with sink ploughing down from the cloud above, then we may well anticipate that we would get a vortex shape like that. If this really happened, we would see elongated clouds and elongated dark spots underneath. Do we? Well, the answer is no, we don't. The oval-shaped thermal, then, is the harmonic of complementary flows. And we can see these two cells together are minding their own business with the two vortices and the rotation of the vortices not interfering with each other. If we get a stronger bubble, again that will go through and when we fly in our glider, <coughs> when we intercept a weak thermal to a strong thermal, we get indications of no sinking between the two cells and the thermal appears oval shaped. So here we go with the rate of climb. It reduces for a little while but that's all and then it goes into a stronger rate of climb before again it we come fall off the end of the thermal as we would normally expect. Here again these bubbles can be forced by other vortices sideways slightly and again we're going to feel the very same vario indications of no sinking between the two cells. The bubbles organize themselves to be co-supportive. Note there is no increase in the volume of air. Here we have a strong thermal coming through. And sometimes they do not necessarily wander around. One will blast through the other. And we get this weaker cell being pushed to one side when it becomes quite dishevelled and slightly broken for a little while. If you get that, quite often, that is if it's unexpected, it's because a strong vortex has come through. A quick little movement, and certainly look up for the clouds above to see if there's a strong thermal generating through, and lo and behold, you will find it, and it will increase your rate of climb quite considerably. And so there you've got a diagram of the conflicting flows where the powerful one will overcome the weak one. But after it's gone through, the weak one, if it's made up of humidity, will completely reform. If it's made of temperature, it might not. Note that all the bubbles contain slightly warmer air than the air around them or more humidity. The top two bubbles weaken but become reinforced by a strong cell underneath. And we can see here's the rotation of the upper weaker cells and here is the rotation of the strong cell that's coming up. So the individual thermal profiles are like that. It goes into there. And the vario climb indications, there's no sink, the thermal appears elongated, and again we end up with this triple climb, no sink, as we pass on through. The lower cell being stronger either reinforces the cell above or overpowers it, again depending on the humidity values of the vortices. The difficulty of circling in the elongated thermal then. Here's this very strong cell and again it's the same deal. Whichever way you turn now you fall out of it and you experience significant sink. Summary then of cloud structures. You can't outclimb the vortex. All thermals are 200 meters across. The thermal outward gust thermal sensations and toroidal bubble 
interactions.